things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds would go back. They went back in glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told to them. Amen. You may be seated. Well, like I said at the beginning this morning, this is the time we, we celebrate, we think of, we rest in the birth of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the Redeemer of the world, the one and only true God. But listen, you can never have Christmas without Easter. You can't have Easter without Christmas. The baby that we read about just now, rather quickly, you've probably read the story if you've been a Christian for any amount of length of time. Many, many times in your life. The baby that is mentioned, the Redeemer of the world, Jesus, the Christ, so much joy at that particular time and at that particular event and understandably so. The baby as he laid in the manger and wrapped tightly in his clothes and his swaddling clothes if you will that wrapped around him the cloth that would wrap him tight. So soft and so pure, right? So soft and so pure to touch would be the child the redeemer of the world but yet on the other hand he's the suffering servant he's the suffering servant he's the sacrifice the perfect one why? Because as we've seen in, our, in the catechism book this morning, in Spurgeon's catechism, there's none righteous, no, not one. None of us have kept the law perfectly. We've, we've sinned. We sin over and over and over again. And we need someone to stand in for us. We need someone. We needed someone to stand in for us and to be our advocate to the Father. To reconcile us back to the Father, the Creator of the world. and because We couldn't do it on our own. None of us. This precious child that we just read in Luke 2 is the, not only a precious child, but He's the one who reconciles those who believe so soft and so pure but yet mentioned in scripture that his body would be so battered and bruised beaten beyond recognition bloodied and battered according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 he who, he who knew no sin would be sin, would take on the sins of those who believed upon Himself to redeem them back to His Father. Like I said, you can't have Christmas without the sacrificial death and the resurrection of the one that we celebrate, His birth. They go hand in hand. You can't stop. You must blend them together, if you will. Remember last year as we looked in Luke chapter 2 and eight days later as, you would, as they would take the firstborn son into the temple and 
and offer him up. And Simeon would take the Lord Jesus knowing and understanding in Luke chapter 2. Remember that he was what? He was the Redeemer of the world. The coming one has arrived. And Simeon would say, Now, now, Father, you can take me home. Now I can die. And Anna would lay eyes on the Redeemer of the world and she too would run out and be a great evangelist, if you will. Telling all that she come in contact with that the sacrifice has arrived. We've all read Isaiah 53 at some time in our lives when it comes to the suffering of Christ. But for the life of me, I do not understand, never will. I wasn't an interpreter, not nowhere am I capable of being one. But for the life of me, I do not understand why the interpreters put Isaiah 53 where they put it. And probably, if it was me, that's not me, of course, but... You can't have Isaiah 53 without having Isaiah 52, 13, 14, and what? 15. Listen to what it says about this child that we just read about in Luke chapter 2. They broke it down into chapters and verses to help us, but what does 52, 13 say? what it says. Let me turn to Isaiah really quick in 52 13 Behold it says Behold my servant shall deal prudently or behold my servant will prosper he will be exalted or he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, show, shall his appearance was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. His visage was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of man. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. The mouths of kings will be closed because of him. On account of him. For what had not been told about them, they will see and have not been heard. They will understand. Before we get into Isaiah 53, it is speaking about the Lord Jesus the Christ. Isaiah 52, 13 is plowing us directly into 53, 1. This child that we just read about in Luke chapter 2 is the coming suffering one. My servant will prosper. He will be victorious. The child that laid in the manger would be victorious. Remember that. The child that laid in the manger would be victorious. Though man would laugh. Though man would mock. Though man right at the beginning would seek to what? To do away with this Redeemer of the world. But according to Scripture, my servant will prosper. He will be victorious. That should thrill you. 
For your salvation is bent is based on what? On his victory, right? His victory over sin. His victory over death. The coming one was sent to give you victory. To give you victory through what you have done, no, but through what he has done. Through his glory, through his honor. This suffering servant, battered and bruised, this child battered and bruised when it becomes an adult, would be one day what? Would be victorious, if you will. This child that we just read in Luke chapter 2 would, would find his place seated at what? As we're going through Hebrews, seated at the right hand of the Father. Where he would be highly exalted. Where he would be high and lifted up. He would be. He would be recognized for who He is. Whether man wants to recognize Him or not, He would be what? Recognized for who He is. See, the theology of Christmas goes way beyond your Christmas tree. It goes way beyond your bows. It goes way beyond your wrapping paper, your presents, your twinkling lights. Your snowman, your snow, your garland. The theology of Christmas is the child in the manger would grow to be the suffering servant, the redeemer of the world, the one who's highly lifted up, the one who's highly exalted. No one would be lifted up to the height of Him. No one would sit at the right hand of the Father like Him. Be He and He alone. Be Christ and Christ alone. And eventually find its way to His to His perfect life and His death on His cross. His resurrection. That's why we're having communion today. To reflect on just that. On just that. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 if you can. Philippians chapter 2 verse, verse 1. Jump down to verse 6. Just go to verse 6. Philippians 2, 6. Though he was God, he never thought of himself as equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he would give up his divine privileges. He would give up what? His divine privileges. As I'm paraphrasing and reading, he would take on a humble position of a slave. He would be born as a human being. But yet, the Redeemer of the world. In His incarnation, when He appears in a human form, He would humble Himself in obedience to the Father perfectly. When He taught, when this child would grow and He would teach, they would say what about him? There is no one who has ever taught with such great authority as him. There is no one who's ever spoke like him. There is no one who ever taught with such power as him. Everywhere he would go, he would literally create a reaction. This mere baby in the manger was beyond a mere baby in the manger. The 
but the Redeemer of the world who would humble himself in obedience to his Father and would die a criminal's death on the cross. But yet what? Sinless. But treat it as a criminal. Treat it as a thug. Treat it as one of us. You see, he would be put in the most inhumane state of to die in when it comes to death at that period of time. The Romans had it perfected. To inflict the maximum amount of pain on the human being upon the cross, the Romans had it down to a science. The baby in the manger would be the suffering servant. And Mary, I don't understand, I can't relate this. I'm not a mother. But mothers, to think of your child, the one you've gave birth to and raised, to give them up in such a way, had to be crushing. He would die a criminal's death on the cross. Philippians talks about, Paul talks about to the Philippians in his letter in verse 8. But then he would be elevated in his resurrection to a place of highest honor and give the name above all names. He would be elevated to a place of highest honor and given a name above all names. As I said before in Hebrews. Right in the beginning in Hebrews chapter 1. Who is sitting at the right hand of the Father? That baby in the manger that's no longer a baby. That one who's no longer hanging on the cross. But resurrected. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. And every knee would bow, every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Declare, it says, Paul says, declare what? Declare what? That he's Jesus? Declare that he's Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord right. of the world. They wouldn't declare that he's Jesus, they would declare that he's Jesus the Messiah, the Lord of the world, the Redeemer, the one and only Redeemer. You see, it's wear a cross if you want to around your neck. But is He Lord of your life? Is He your Redeemer? Many people in the world, what? Today, I mean, it's interesting. We live in a society, okay, where, where the pagan world, what? Will sing what? Songs about baby Jesus. Crazy, isn't it, if you think about it? The pagan world will put out nativity scenes about baby Jesus or whatever. People will walk around with crosses around their neck in reference to Jesus. But how many wear a cross around their neck or sing a Christmas hymn. 
in reference to him being Lord of their life, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world who has saved their souls, who freely gave himself up for them personally, who freely, 2 Corinthians 5.21, took upon their sin upon himself and felt the wrath of the Father and the beating to where the beating to where those who knew him best would not recognize him. See Paul in the letter to Philippians he says listen there's only one God. There's only one Redeemer. That's right. The Lord Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Amen. And Paul says what? He's no longer. He's no longer in the manger. But he's sitting at the right hand. The Father. That's right. Father. My servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. Many would be amazed when they see him. Isaiah 52, 14 says. Many would be amazed. Why? Because the baby in Luke 2 would be born to die. He would be amazing from the start of his incarnation into his adult life and then to the cross. No one would compare. No one would compare to him. He would be amazing in every aspect of his life. Why? Because he is truly the redeemer of the world. Right. In Psalm chapter 22 and verse 14, I'm going to read rather quickly. When you think about the baby in the manger, think about as he grew in this. My life would be poured out like water. My bones are all out of joint. My heart would be like wax melting within me. They're speaking about the dislocation of the bones and the heart during the time of crucifixion of Christ. My humanly strength would be dried up like baked clay. My tongue would stick to the roof of my mouth. He laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. Is that not what they did? But still in his love, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. They have pierced my hands and my feet. My enemies will stare at me and gloat. They will divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. I don't mean to put a damper on your Christmas and the joy of it. For it's a joyous time but understand this, that who we celebrate is the very one who gave himself up willingly for us. Who would be so disfigured he can hardly seem to be human.
And from his appearance, one would scarcely even know he was a man. This is Christ, the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of the world. This Jesus would shock men. All opposition to him would be silenced. He would startle or he would sprinkle many nations, it says in verse 15. He would sprinkle many nations. Meaning what? Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, would come as a sacrifice, as a child, as the Redeemer of the world. His shed blood would be sprinkled throughout the world, throughout all the nations, offering forgiveness for all those who would what? Believe. For all those who would believe. All those. To all who would believe, Salvation would be offered. But as you jump down to verse 50, chapter 53, verse 1 and 2, and you see that he would come into a land, he would come into a land that would not what? And still to this day what? Does not believe. Do not believe. Kings would stand speechless in his presence. Of course they would. Because according to Hebrews 1 3, 8 1, and 12 2, he is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. And that's just to name a few of the verses that mention his what? His glory, yeah. his power. No one higher. Earthly kings would stand speechless. It was Pilate himself who stood what? Got nothing more to say. I have nothing to say. I find nothing to accuse this man of. The one you brought before me. What they see, what they had not been told, they will understand what they had not heard about. This child who was placed in a manger, who was born in a manger, who was wrapped in swaddling clothes, wrapped in swaddling blankets, if you will, he would be born in a land. He would be born in a land, in a place. In a world of unbelief. See the vast unbelief of Israel. It was dry and it was a spiritually barren land. The ground would be dry if you will until Christ appeared. Until he appeared. That's just like in our lives as someone comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they, they live their life in a dry, barren land. Do they not? Yeah. They live their life in a dark, dry, barren land. Sure Until Christ appears in their lives and breathes eternal life into them. It's no longer dry. It's no longer barren. But it's pure. Pure in what they have done? No, never, but pure in what Christ has done in their life. Before you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a dry, barren land. Mere dry bones, if you will. Jump down to verse 2 of Isaiah 53. My servant would grow up 
in the Lord's presence it speaks of. Like a tender green shoot. Like a root in dry ground. That's where he would grow. That's where he would do the Father's will. And he would do it perfectly. There was nothing beautiful or majestic, if you will, to look at in his incarnation, but he was the redeemer of the world, the Messiah. And in the love of the Father to the world, as he gives up his son, as he gives up his son, his son would be despised and rejected, refused. Many would turn their backs on him. Many would turn their backs on him and look the other way. Look the other way from the Redeemer of the world. This would happen immediately. Immediately. The minute he was brought into the world, his incarnation, this would happen immediately. Many would turn their backs on him. He was despised by many, and many didn't care. You should be thrilled this morning that you sit in these pews and you care and you believe. Because if it wasn't for Him reaching down and saving your soul, you would be counted among the many that despise Him, that refuse Him, that turned your back on Him. But no, in His grace, in His love, for some reason He reaches down and He chooses you and He says, this one is mine. Anything special you've done? Heck no. You don't bring nothing to the table but your filthy rags and your messed up life and your accumulation of sinful deeds over and over and over and over again. And then the Son comes into your life and saves your soul and you stand before the Father and the Father doesn't see your sinfulness, but He sees the sacrifice of the One that He sent many years ago into that dry, barren land who offered himself up for you and for me for all who would believe he would be pierced for our rebellion crushed for his own sin no The child would grow up and be crushed for our sin. He would be crushed for our sin. He would be pierced for our rebellion. He would be beaten beyond recognition. He would suffer a death so we can be redeemed. This is a golden opportunity this week. That when the question comes up, or even today and tomorrow, when the question comes up and the opportunity presents themselves about the beauty of Christmas, about the reason behind Christmas, to take the golden opportunity and, and just speak a few words about why the sun come. It wasn't for us to have a holiday. It wasn't for us to have a time to get together with family and friends. It really wasn't. Though we've made it that way, have we not? 
we've made it a time to get together with hall with family and friends and and days off work and whatever however you want to look at it. whatever else our sinful minds can 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 accumulate into to fulfill our selfish sinful desires but it's for us to remember that he was led as a lamb to the slaughter born and led as a lamb to the slaughter for our sins and he never opened his mouth he would go willingly longing to fulfill the plan of the father for you and for me And as we partake this morning in this, in this communion table, I want you to remember that communion is a reflection of what the Lord has done for us, for all who would believe. It's an act of obedience. whereby the members of his church, us, look forward to the great coming Redeemer one day to take us home in one way or another. The bread is the, the body, the wine, the blood of Christ. It points us to the great redeeming act of the Lord Jesus. What we do is not to be taken lightly, is to be held up in highest esteem. And it's for all those here this morning that are living their lives in an act of obedience, and especially when it comes to the, as a baptized believer. If you're not a baptized believer, then let it pass by. Let's remember today. Let's remember tomorrow. For what He's done. Jesus, the Redeemer of the world. The sacrifice. Let us pray. Well, Father, Lord, we thank You for this time this morning and as we or take of this communion table, Lord, and pray that we do see its significance, that it speaks of all that you've done, bearing the sins of all who would believe upon your back, the wrath of the Father, for he's so holy. We love you and we thank you and do pray that this morning as we partake of this communion table that, that all those that partake of it are know and understand are baptized believers and if not to let it pass by. For you command us for let a man examine himself before partaking of his table. We love you and we thank you. We praise you for this time that we call Christmas. But slow us down that we don't get caught up in the worldliness of it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.